And the topic for today is the sevenfold way four forces high impact academic work in the quadruple helix. I call on Patrick to unpack these three phrases. Uh, the first uh, phrase is the sevenfold way. The second one is the four forces. And the third one is the quadruple helix. And uh, of course, how we can actually bring them all together in order to advance our course and bring some kind of relevance to our everyday engagements, especially uh, pertaining higher education. So on that note, uh, Patrick, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, the purpose of today is to actually unpack all those. So it's already in the PowerPoints I'm going to use in the presentation. So I will simply go in straight away with the presentation. And once we come to that stage, I will try to elaborate on the those particular constructs. So I'll start now um, the PowerPoint. Welcome everybody. Thanks again to Professor Andy for you know um, starting this off a very naturally interesting way. Uh, we are actually about training the next generation of academics, students and professionals. And by professionals, of course, we mean a lot of other stakeholders. Professionals can be in academia, they can be industry, in industry, they can be in government. And therefore the topic itself that brings everything together is the sevenfold way, four forces, just like Andy said, and high impact academic work in the quadruple helix. The quadruple helix is just a fanciful way to summarize those four major areas in society where we as knowledge workers are supposed to add value. The first is academia itself from which all of us were trained to have some specific uh, disciplinary expertise. The other one is government, industry and wider society. So the business of the day actually is to explore how well we all traverse these bases in the work we do. I am Patrick and these are my roles. Uh, and I want to say that in as much as I'm quickly using the PowerPoint template from Co City University, uh, where I'm also uh, working, um, I, I'm also a director of the International Center for Research and Human Development, at Dominica University, but I actually started doing work in there before I joined CCU as well. And before then, I had also founded the African Higher Education and Research Observatory in the UK, that was 2005. So the business of all this is to try to galvanize skills amongst all of us to share experiences that we have with the ones that our colleagues in the home countries have in order to come to better understanding of how to use knowledge in a more impactful way. Um, in today's work, we are looking at explaining how these various aspects come together under the learning outcomes. So we're going to understand what we mean by the sevenfold ways and how we can work in those ways in order to enhance the impact of our work globally, okay? And we're also going to look at the four forces in high impact academic work. Those four forces are very important and I'm going to explain them as well. Of course, I've said that the quadruple helix stands for those four main areas of work in society where we will try as much as possible to be visible in terms of the things we do. And when we want to bring it, bring it all together, we will be asking crucial questions like how can the priorities of the academia and the professoriate in Nigeria, by which I mean lecturers, senior lecturers, uh, professors, all the academics, of course, also supporting staff, how can we, you know, remodel the way we all work within academia in order that we can make impact enough, not just in academia, but in all those other three areas. I would like to flag this off by providing some personal motivation, because if we are trying to say, for instance, that we want to make impact in society, 
who want to make impact in academia, in industry and government. It begs the question whether we are, you know, we are skilled enough to do that. You know, to be skilled enough to do that, we might be able to look at some of the steeples of excellence, uh, riot excellence, that are material to being capable to do the kind of things we want to do. And by riot, we mean research, integration of knowledge, applications, and teaching. You might wonder why I decided to put teaching at the end of it all. It's just because teaching has to happen in all of them. In other words, we have to learn how to teach research principles properly to learners or people who want to work in research. We have to be able to understand how to teach skills in how to integrate knowledge. I, 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 I want to be particular here because this is where we most of us fall on our thoughts because we are too, too narrow in the way we conceptualize higher education and specializations. We need to move beyond limiting ourselves too much to what we studied maybe up to master's or to PhD. That's important, but we need to uh, grow just talking about those disciplines as if that's the only thing we can ever do. So that that set of skills for bringing knowledge together across disciplines is called integration of knowledge. And I decided to call it as well, I of K. So you can always remember it when you think of I of T, Internet of, Internet of Things, isn't it? So this is another kind of I of something that's very important. Applications, of course, is so important. We all know that. If you do a lot of work in your area, but you're not applying it, you know, in a way that is meaningful to add value to, to those four bases, then your visibility will be highly reduced. And of course, the teaching itself, the learning about teaching, which is what happens in education, if you remember, is, uh, you know, is what is called a scholarship of teaching. And all of us must understand that. Even professionals must understand that because the professionals themselves run courses and CPDs. Some of the senior professionals will have to coach the younger ones, so they have to understand the principles of how to transmit knowledge, the different levels of understanding of their audiences and things like that. Okay, in terms of the staples that I have in mind, you keep hearing these constructs that for an academic of a professional to be able to be successful, they need to be able to write grants to be able to win funding to do their work. And I want to emphasize that this is not just about academics doing that. Professional, uh, professionals do a lot of grant writing or bids that bring money in to support what they're doing. So all of us here are, in a sense, doubling up as both academic, uh, academicians are as well as professionals. Because when an academic practices his craft, he's a professional. And when a professional uses research skills, okay, picked up in universities and higher education to do their work, they are actually academics. So why you talk about uh, corporate academics, those academics that are really focused on making sure that they are applying their knowledge in the corporate world across the quadruple helix, we call them corporate academics. We can also talk about academic professionals, those that, those professionals that are the high end they are at the high end of value creation in their organization. They use a lot of research skills. So I want to, I want us to see that we are not trying to isolate professionals in this course. Everybody learns from this course. Guest lectures. Yes. The kind of things we are doing today. We'll be able to do workshops, run, you know, seminars to exchange ideas. We need to publish our ideas, research publications. We need to understand global practice, best practices. So if I am if you might feel statistics, for instance, I should be able to know what are the dominant, you know, uh, uh, constructs in statistics. Who can I regard as ex experts with myself in either my own area of statistics or other areas of statistics? So we need to understand global best practices to know the colleagues that we need to collaborate with, to know the kind of industry sectors we can apply our knowledge and things like that. Then curriculum innovations is very important because it is by innovating the curricula to bring in those best practices. Imagine constructs and knowledge in the wider field, in the quadruple helix, 
uh, that it will enable us to write good case studies, for instance. Vineyards, vineyards that can support what we're trying to do, or even write books, research monographs, and other things. Uh, we need to be able to generate income, isn't it? Income for our institution, but most of the income can come to our own research uh, groups to enable us to do our work, to enable us to do our teaching. One of the things I need to emphasize is that this idea of generating income, most academics tend to do it in just the R part of the riot. And that is where we miss out on the other three. So we try to write research grants on just those technical areas we specialize in. That is very limiting. I get a lot of grants from just, you know, uh, to enable me improve my teaching. Okay. In, in the university in UK where I, I lectured, I got not less than about 20,000 pounds on just teaching alone to develop my teaching. So that's very important that we should know that writing grants is not just about research. You need to interface all these four elements of the riot in order to be excellent, in order to be riot excellent, which is the aim of some of these training programs. Now, another aspect of the staples of excellence I'm looking at is entrepreneurship. Enterprise development, employability. Why do I choose the, the, the three? They have to go together to be impactful. Entrepreneurship is about the understandings, the theories, you know, uh, principles about how business works and how people can set it up or even not setting it up just outside for themselves to own it, using those constructs in any organization they are employed to be high value, uh, you know, uh, uh, staff. And we then call them entrepreneurs. So please, I want us to understand that entrepreneurship covers all this. Okay. Enterprise development is the real game of establishing companies. So you're developing enterprises that can give other people jobs, that can create wealth across again the quadruple helix. Employability is to make sure that the people that are working with us, the primary stakeholders, that we coach the students, for instance, academics and professionals that come for short courses or workshops, you know, in unis or in higher educational institutions where we are based, are actually improving their employability skills, that they can have more skills on top of the technical disciplinary skills to enable them to win uh, in the competitive world of the job market, something like that. I want to remind you, though that's not the major part of today, that there are 42 skills under employability alone. <laughs> yeah, and this, this is why you may see these things are just, uh, you know, lists that are quite deep constructs. I, 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 I supported a PhD that is just based on employability, embedding employability skills in leisure and tourism uh, management, you know, uh, which is one of the key areas some countries can win uh, revenues to support their citizen. So that's very important. Well, I'm going to, we are going to run another, a complete international conference on entrepreneurship, enterprise development and employability. Now we look at careers and human development. All of us understand again why it's important, but I want to emphasize this seven years and I'm going to come to that. Then workshops, short courses and conferences. There are other things we can add to this, but I'm saying at least these nine things tend to cover most of the things we are supposed to know how to do. The gap in knowledge that we are trying to fill today is that we don't do well enough, even in all this, across the four elements of the riot, you see? And that is where we don't do things well. That is where we may not be globally recognized. Our impact is very minimal because of that. I, um, I don't want to be a bit sarcastic. I, I, I tend to say that academics, for instance, who do not play these games across the quadruple helix can be called terrestrial academics. Okay. To be corporate academic, you have to go outside the classroom and do a lot of work. Okay. So thank you so much for listening to this initial gambit. But let us look at the key questions, therefore, that we are looking at. The seven ways I'm going to come to that. Then, these seven ways are so important. When I expose us to them, you will see that Majority of, of, of us, even here, are not doing the seven ways. We may just be doing one, two, one of the two ways. What about the other five? And that's where I want us to pay attention, please. And the academics and professionals are also involved. 
have already cleared the ground of professionals. I see them as, you know, uh, academic professionals, those that use a lot of advanced knowledge to add value. Okay. Majority of PhDs produced in the world are not in the classroom. They're not in university. They're in the KPMGs, Pricewaterhouse, Microsoft, Google. Go there, you see them. PhD data science. Majority of them are in Google. Not even. So I want us to see that I'm not making an essential difference as such between what we call academics today and professionals. I mean, high end professionals are almost academics and vice versa. Vice versa. So, current understanding of impact and excellence in education is very important. I'm going to unpack that fully today. Okay. What does it cost to resource impact and excellence? There are personal costs, there are institutional costs. But however, we need to cover the cost by funding. That's why you recognize more if you can if you can attract those uh, grants, you know, um, how to generate enabling incomes exactly to do that. And then how do we do this better across the sevenfold way? Let me know whether we are close enough to this exactly. So that's the sevenfold way. Um, I'll try to know whether I can expand it so that you can see um, what it is. Um, to do that, um, let me see. Because the point is, I have not seen it, and I want to see that it can it can be enlarged. Okay. Well, let me say that what you what you had before. Let me just say, if you look, forget about the fact that you're not seeing it clearly. Please, I'm going to send. We're going to send it in the in the in the notes. We're going to compile and send to all of you that attended full notes and reading packs and everything because this is training. If you can see what we are doing there, we are putting a corporate academic at the center of a universe. Surrounded by, okay, look at him as almost the sun in the solar system. And then he's surrounded by some couple of moons or other planets. And there are seven in number. The first one there is student services. Every academic or professional that has to be engaged in education and training has to understand that students and learners are primary stakeholders. They are the people you are trying to make sure you give value. All of us do that as academics. However, when we look at the various small things we need to do, which is the other one here, all those bullet points here, we need to check whether we are doing all those things very well. There are 33 of these little uh, bullet points that surround this sevenfold way. First of all, there are seven of it, student services. Now, as an academic or professional, you have to ask yourself, what are my affiliated higher educational institutions where I'm, I'm doing some work? It doesn't have to be my only my own institution, you know. Global academics and professionals are linked to different institutions. I, I can't even imagine it to be a bit like a, a revelation to, to, to begin to talk to you today about the number of institutions that Professor Andy Madiche is working with. There's so many. From South Africa to China to wherever. This is what I talk about. So those are his affiliate institutions. I also have mine, okay? Um, in some of them, I'm grounded in doing a lot of serious work, like at the CCU, where I'm a professor. Not only a professor there, but also a director of academic practice and the deputy director of research and innovation. But of course, I also am affiliated to Ibado, Dominican University, where I've, I run a full center, which I founded in partnership with the institution. So all of us have. Then I'm affiliated with some UK universities and organizations, you know, that, you know, work with me on the different platforms that I manage, for instance. There are so many of them. There are about eight platforms I manage, you know, in that sense. So you can imagine there is quite a plethora of, you know, affiliated institutions. But the important thing is to ask myself on expression, what value can I give to each one according to their dispositions? That's very important. So please, don't think that because you got a job in CCU or DUI or University of Manchester or Pricewaterhouse, that that's where it ends. No, there are a lot of values you can add out within and outside of those businesses. That's very important. And for that, there are another couple of bullet points that we must unpack. They're very important. So let's now go to, um, uh, no, I finish this quickly. It's very important. Now, the other one is relationships with colleagues. How many of us realize that our colleagues are our internal customers? We must work in our organizations 
in a way that will give value to our colleagues. I work with Andy today on the SSJ's academy platform. Okay, Chukwu is there. If you go now, boy is there. A lot of us are there. What are we doing? We are giving value to each other by those conversations. Sometimes people post things for other people to share into. Even on this very workshop today, you can see that Professor Andy is already posting some interesting books for us to look. That is what is called. Okay? So this is very important. I've seen colleagues who, in the university or any area they are working, keep to themselves so much, keep hiding little things they think are very valuable, wonderful knowledge that only themselves want to share. These things are not important. There's so much in the world to go around. Why are you hiding what you know? That's the problem. Work with people because they can enrich your perspective and vice versa. The other thing is also client services. You must have people or entities or organizations that you're giving value that are almost like buying services from you. Okay, if you are employed in a university, for instance, to be honest, forget about the monthly salary, okay? What are you doing? You are giving value to that institution and that's why they're paying you money. So you are actually, that institution is a client for you. For you, you are almost like some a knowledge carrier selling knowledge to the institution that pays you salary. When you are not officially a nine to five person, then you can still be giving values as a consultant and people are paying you on consultancy basis. So it doesn't matter how you're paid. Important things that you're adding value and you're seeing those people as clients. And therefore, you maintain every level of customer service excellence in even relating with your own institution and other people inside that institution, something like that. The other thing is that you can also look at governments. Look at this. Government, including, you know, Nigerian and African countries. Governments have a lot of business. As a matter of fact, in most developing countries today, knowing that the manufacturing base is very low. Majority of the, uh, of the wealth that is moved around is government, you know, providing money for things. Of course, they can borrow themselves out of existence, but they still do that, okay? So that everybody that is trying to be active must engage government. In Nigeria alone, we have about 56 ministries, departments, and agencies. No, 56 ministries. We're not even talking about agencies like, you know, different research institutes. And so you can imagine if you understand that game very well and know that your skills, maybe as a marketer, as a statistician, computer scientist, can support some of those ministries. Do you see how it can enlarge your coast by walking across boundaries, by coming out of that classroom, little shell where you are excelling in terms of the R and trying to do things in terms of the I, the A and the T? Very important. Sometimes we may be hired to come and run a workshop to train people in their own companies and we are paid as consultants. So again, that company is seeing you as somebody that is coming in to share knowledge and you, they are a client organization to you. So I, want, I just want to make sure that you understand why I am slow on this page because that is the sevenfold way I'm trying to unpack. Now, the other thing you have to now think about how do I relate? How do I relate with, on this other section, which is called global partners? You have UNESCO, World Bank, African Development Bank, how many of them? IMF, a lot of world organizations and other organizations that are public in other countries may need your skills. So if you write a grant, for instance, for a work in public health, you may get the money from World Health Organization. So you are relating with that world body. So all of us must ask ourselves serious questions today. With the level of skill I have, can I train myself more to a point I can actually be helping to solve some problems that the world bodies are focused on? A good example is the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, or, you know, I think 17 of them or something like that including poverty alleviation or all those type of things, education. Have you ever thought about trying to know whether you can start solving some of those problems or come to a group and form a group and start solving it? Or from your own department, create a consultancy unit to be able to look into those problems. This is Sorry, why Patrick. we may not be able to do it right. Okay. Sorry. Now, finally, 
Okay, I know. I just finished before I come out. Finally, right. you now talk about professional bodies. So what I've done is to show you that wheel, which is coming to you at the end of this workshop, when we write up all the notes and send to you. And it's all free because that's the game. The game is to make all of us come up to date with the things we can do. Okay, summarize now. Those are the seven uh, ways. The student services. One of the key things is that I must write my notes for my students in the best possible way. And what is the best possible way? I will share with you a lot. To write notes that are at the level of the student I'm trying to write for. I cannot write, send, uh, you know, lecture notes that are meant to final year student to first year student. I must ask myself, how do I account for the difference in level of understanding of these two levels of students? Or even from undergraduates to postgraduate, even from beginning masters to PhD, there's a, a bit of a, a gap there. You know, there are different levels of understanding. Or to my fellow academics. So each time I'm working with each level, I, I can change and flex my language to accommodate them. Affiliated institutions across the globe, we've talked about that. Relationship with colleagues. Audit your relationship. Are you really supporting your colleagues well? Are you collaborating? Are you doing joint publications or not? Are you a loner trying to do things only yourself, which can be hard to do? If you do things only yourself, you may not be very pro prolific. You may not produce enough. Because it takes time to produce good things, okay? And industry players, client services, governments, wider society, a lot of them, partners, global partners, UNESCO, and things like that. In Africa, Hero, for instance, we have a full school. Of course, if, even in ICRE, the International Center for Research and Enterprise Development, which is uh, linked to uh, Afri Hero in UK, we have schools. We have a full school of that we call global issues, global issues and uh, world systems. Can you imagine that? Everything about some of these bodies, we simply break them down and articulate how we can work with those organs on the problems that they are focused on, that are cognate to our field, that have some affinity with our field. And we're not doing it alone, we can work with others. Professional bodies, of course, so many professional bodies. I take myself, for example, I'm a statistician, a mathematical scientist. So I have to work with National Mathematical uh, Center, which I've worked with as well. <laughs> you know, in 2008, I was a visiting professor there. Okay. Now I have to work with the uh, Nigerian Statistical Association. That's my own. Then in UK, the Royal Statistical Society, for instance. Now, you can be accountants. What of ICANN? Bankers, what of AIB? So that is something I know you understand. But you need to work with them actively. Don't just go there as a spectator. Do something. Let them know you're adding value and things like that. We can actually now carry on with the key questions. Yes, Patrick, can I just uh, stop you briefly? Um, okay. um, I saw a hand raised up. I think it's somebody by the name of Buga Yefa or something like that. Okay. If, it's, if he yes. or she is on here, can we just um, give two minutes? Oh yeah, to hear that's right. What the participant has to say. Okay, we're listening. Uh, yeah, Bogayefa is the name I can see here. So, we, okay, if I don't hear in the next sixty seconds. Uh, you might as well carry on. Okay, we just wait a bit. It's also opportunity for me to to have a breather. To be honest, <laughs> you know. Um, okay, maybe we will continue. We we can also take questions. Uh, during break. Yeah, yeah. At, at the end, yeah. At the um, end. And th th thanks for, for, for the uh, journey so far. I think that is uh, part of the uh, the sevenfold way. Um, yes. Is, is there a chance you might want to uh, zero into the four forces? Uh, exactly. In, in the light of the sevenfold way that you've mentioned so far. Yes, that's what I'm exactly going into now. Uh, I also want to thank new arrivals, Professor uh, Godfrey Odo. Is here with us, the, the former DVC uh, administration at the uh, University of Fuyo in Nigeria. Thank you for coming. And then we continue. Thank now, the, the four forces we are looking at, which is exactly where we are now, okay? Understanding the four forces. The, these are the four forces, of course, broken down in bullet points. The first one is to have a different mindset for doing the kind of work we're doing, to have the corporate academic mindset, philosophy. What does it mean? A corporate, academic, and enterprise development philosophy means 
if I'm doing research, if I'm doing teaching, if I'm doing integrating knowledge, okay, if I'm applying my knowledge, in other words, if I'm applying the what I call the riot, you know, uh, uh, business in whatever environment, it doesn't have to be inside the classroom, mind. it can be any other environment. As long as, as long as I'm doing this, the question I ask myself is, what comes out of my effort? It has this question is fundamental. Um, I just want to take us back quickly to why this is crucial. You remember that Nigeria is has you know is, has been an independent country for almost six decades. Do you wonder why we are still a developing country? Shouldn't you have really developed? These are the crucial questions I want us to think about. And I think, and I've thought about this seriously over years. Right from 2005, when we established the Afri Hero, for instance, that we're not doing the academic game the right way. It was quite shocking when I came to that realization. The reason is, the, the way we are incentivized to work promotes us publishing to become, to move, to be promoted, which is not bad in itself, okay? Because we need to be, you know, developing uh, scholarly. However, there are ingredients that are missing in that game because we are not tasked to produce things from the knowledge. We just talk about things and write things. If we do not do things and build things for knowledge, where are we? That's why we don't have a manufacturing base. That's why Naira can crash any day. And this statement costs across Africa. So why is it that Africa, as a continent, remains underdeveloped up to the majority of African countries? And this is the problem we have. So we need to change the game from what it is today. The one I call traditional academia. Okay? If I want to be sarcastic, terrestrial academia. You know, something very close to dinosaurs and things. We almost all of us are dinosaurs, myself included, because we are not doing the right thing. So what I'm focusing on is this. If I supervise a PhD, for instance, the question I ask myself is, apart from those theoretical depth contributions to research, to theory, to uh, practice, to policy making, what products can I create from the result? What services can I create? Because even if it's not products, you can create a service. Can I create a framework that is new, that is improved, that I can use to get back into the quadruple helix and start helping people to do things better? If we've been asking these questions of academia, because I know lecturers can do that, it's just that they've not been first to know that this is important and nobody bothers about it that's why all of them do what they're told to do to get promoted you don't blame them but if you told them that you cannot be promoted as fast as you could if you are not playing this game this way that philosophy is fundamental i've used it so many times okay excellence the next one is excellence in research in those four areas which is called riot excellence i've already covered that already if you're excellent in only research but you're not able to integrate knowledge. You cannot even write very big grants. Because to write a big grant, you need knowledge, different phase coming together. You're not going to be an expert in all of them, no? But you need to be able to know how to bring them together, assemble the team or consortium that can work on them. This is what I'm talking about. So your capacity to bring, you know, people together, your team building skills, you know, institution building skills come to the fore in that situation. And of course, there are also Disciplines that are close enough to your own that you must master. I am not just a statistician today, and I don't want to be. Because I am also far more than that. I do a lot of statistics. But the question I ask myself, and so what? What is this statistics going to do for me? How am I going to use it to do things? And once I ask those questions, I find that I need to know a little bit more for maybe applied economics, maybe mathematics, maybe some bit of applied computing. Okay? Business analytics. <laughs> Takes me straight into user research, takes me into you know uh, you know uh, data analytics and things, which of course is just the things on things. So you need to connect. Why am I supervising PhDs in mathematical finance? Because statistics undercuts it. My, uh, luckily for me, the area of statistics I studied is close enough to the mathematics they use in finance. So I started doubling into you know working intensively in that area. I produce about four PhDs in mathematical finance. I'm talking about. So what I'm saying is this: we should not limit ourselves to the single disciplines we study. Even if that discipline is so lucrative for us, we are making a lot of money in it, we should still ask questions of connections across disciplines. Very important. 
And that is how our applications can be enriched and eventually are teaching. Because when you are doing all these things, you don't have better case studies to bring to the classroom. And students will be saying, ah, so this thing, this thing we're being taught can be used in these areas. You then you draw the aha, the wow factor from the students. Because you are teaching the your discipline with oven hot cases from the field, from the streets, not textbook examples. And you can teach anything, any, anything, anytime because you are always immersed in practice and things like that. So that's the second, uh, you know, uh, facet of the four forces. Of course, I put a little notes there. I'm going to expand it in the full paper and send to all of us. So under the excellence, you need to understand the key types of research. There is basic, applied, and translational. Look at the way I say the translation. I mean what? Translating all the things we say in journal papers into products and services or frameworks or ideas or models that can really be used to do things in society. And that is where we then join up with the professional. Because if you see a guy working in KPMG, he's actually translating knowledge. We should not leave that game to only those guys. They, they get so well paid doing that, using our own journal papers and our writings. Why can't we cut into that as well and take a little bit of uh, that game? Because we know we can play it, but nobody bothers us to force us to play. It, and that's what I'm trying to do. The key teaching formats, okay. For the teaching side, there are five teaching formats that 95% of academics use. I also use them. Of course, lectures, all of us do that. What I'm doing today is almost like a lecture in a sense, isn't it? Only that is a bit of an expanded kind of lecture. Small group and pair discussions, we do that just so that students can, you know, talk about practice within the classroom straight away and then come up with ideas. Practice focused exercises, scenario challenges like case studies, case studies, of course, you can add role models and things like that. But I want to let you know today that beyond these five normal formats that we can get by with, we survive on them most of the time. They're almost like the workforce. There are 15 more pedagogical strategies, which I'm going to write in another paper. And because now, if you can imagine my power, ability to do stuff, if I know these five that everybody knows and knows the other 15, there's nothing I cannot teach in the world by the grace of God. Because I know how to call each one into play. When I notice from the body language of my students that they're not following, I can call in another strategy of the world. By the time I play around the 20 strategies, there's nobody I cannot reach. And that's, that's the beauty of not limiting yourself. And then let's go to the for, uh, third force. The third force is having a deep set of skills for students, graduates, and startups. For example, the key work skills, we've done that in another workshop, and seven E's of education and personal development, which I'm going to cover quickly here. Let me just mention the seven E's in case we may not have enough time. The first E there is expertise. All of us have it. You can be a historian, a real estate, uh, expert, a statistician, international marketer, entrepreneur. So we all have our disciplines, accounting and finance, all of us. So all those disciplines you study in departments in university gives you that first E. However, even that first E expertise, we are not using it well enough as I've already explained. We use it more in some one narrow area that you think is okay. But we're not playing it across the quadruple helix. Learn to do that from now. Okay. Now, the other thing we also think about is the second E is experience. So if I were to build a university today, first year student to start solving problems from the immediately after that, they are one week of uh, drinking and they have to get into solving problems in the class straight away. Of course, I'm not trying to be too critical. We give them problems to solve, but notice that some of those problems are too textbook like. They're not coming, they're not really real life because real life problems are unstructured. That's when you develop their uh, capacity to use their, their thinking to structure problems, to think about, oh, how do we really do this from what we know? And that is experience. Of course, at some stage, you send them on industrial attachments and other things, attach them to, you know, uh, practice. But how do we do that now? Each department must have a consultancy unit or kind of lab. Of course, my, uh, microbiology, biological sciences, their labs are their consultancy units because they can bring in external work and do their and submit reports. Money comes in, for instance, to support again what they're doing. In statistics, for instance, uh, when I was lecturing in Unisic, I established a consultancy firm in Enugu 
42 on UK Street. I don't, I don't forget that. Okay. And that was to practice statistics. Eventually, the department decided to make it a consultancy unit that every lecturer is contributing to. And I liked it that way. But they told me to manage it on behalf of the department. The amount of external problems to solve in those three years around that particular, uh, you know, Sigma X statistical consultants before I left for the, for my, for my PhD is heavy. I have so many case studies to use to teach statistics. That's why today, after nearly 20 something years or going to 30 years, I reestablished it in UK and called it Sigma Z. I only removed the X and put the Z. Nothing has changed. The same thing. Problems come from industry. Oh, Patrick, can you do this analysis for us? We need it in two weeks. I finish it. They pay me money. But it's not the money alone that matters. The fact that I'm now seeing how some aspects of that, my training in statistics, gives me more experience applying statistics. Then I can go into the classroom, I show it to students, and they'll be happy that they're learning practice. That's what I mean. Then the, the third E is entrepreneurship. Oh, that is the big one. Everybody now is doing entrepreneurship. Government is supporting it. It's now mandatory in universities. But do you know that in some universities today, Directors of entrepreneurship centers are uh, professors of history. Professors of history? I'm not saying that if you read history, you cannot be entrepreneurial. But how many Nigerian historians are that entrepreneurial? How many? Or understand entrepreneur, entrepreneurship principles enough to be able to, you know, help students to acquire it well. So they're just there as figureheads because maybe this is a friend. These are the things we have to fix. People have to be in roles. They have the real experience to manage. Okay? Then the fourth E. Enterprise development, that's my baby. That is building companies, digital companies that can scale in order to, you know, cascade skills across the Padupu health. Then the fourth E is what? Emotional intelligence. All the soft skills you need as a knowledge worker, whether academic, whether professional, whether gra just recent graduate, whether senior manager of an organization or CEO, minister, you need skills that are other than technical skills. And there are, for instance, the 32 skills of highly creative people is among them. The 42 skills of, employ uh, of employability are among them. Of course, communication skills, all of them are there. Ability to talk to people in a way that can move them, challenge them to be better. We need to teach those things in the classroom from first year. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, what of the last one? Execution. Doing things. If we do not learn how to complete tax within deadline and up to quality, right from first year, we are not helping anybody. We are not even helping ourselves. Because that's why the country, all the continent, we are not. So I finished with the seven years when we come to that again. Now the final one out of the four forces is the more technical, but still important. It is having frameworks and toolkits for habitually creating wealth and job opportunities. How about that? So if I am in marketing, for instance, I develop frameworks that can make marketing work easier. I still publish my papers in marketing, for instance, something like that. If I'm in statistics, I develop better frameworks for doing statistics in the world, in the real world. And I've done a lot of them. I have to even confess that I had to, first of all, start building the research process into a full compass. And I call it the research methods canvas. I'm going to share it today. That is the kind of thing that enables us to do all these things I'm talking about, and I'm going to share it with us immediately so that we don't forget, you know. And these are the that is Then, this is okay at the general level, but at a particular level, what I did in 2019 is to complete a PhD supervision where we developed a model for establishing digital firms that can compete with the Googles of the world. It took us four solid years of PhD research to come up with what is called the integrated business model template. Those in business today may realize that one of the most dominant models for creating businesses is called the Business Model Canvas, BMC, that was founded by Ostewaga and Pigo in 2012. But in 2019, we superseded that. We retained it at the core, but we brought in other elements for digitizing firms, for making them digital, because it's less, far less uh, uh, far more cost effective to build digital fair than to keep building, you know, all these uh, buildings 
For instance, if I want to build a university, why should I start building a, a physical university when the CCU is there, DU is there, University of EU is there, UNISIC is there? What are those buildings doing? I just need to link up to them when we use their classrooms and facilities and then bring in the, the, the digital uh, you know, uh, ideas. And then all of us work together, everybody benefits. I don't need to keep building things again. I, I can do things on this on this plan. Okay, now I talked about the research methods canvas, isn't it? Okay, quickly, some of those soft skills I'm talking about is ability to write well, analysis and problem solving, listening, problem solving, public speaking, doing, which is again execution. And I've again listed the seven E's of education and personal development so that once I send you these PowerPoints, at least you see them, I remember them. Now, that is that particular canvas I talked about. I will, I will simply uh, try and make it clear why it is a bit better than what we are doing at the moment. I'll tell you what we are doing at the moment. I'll tell you what we are now doing more that is that makes this canvas powerful now. This canvas is what I used to do all this I'm talking about. But we are running mentorship programs, apprenticeship to help people to understand how it can, it can be used. It's not as simple as it looks here because some of these things, to expand on some of them, may take about two, another 10, 15 pages of actions and activities and thinking. And th so it's quite a deep system. But let me just explain it uh, summarily uh, since I know that we're going to give you richer notes after this. Okay. Now, when you start with a problem in research, all of us do this, you think about your problem studied and why are you studying the aim the objectives all of us know this the expected contributions to knowledge i just use CST, cstk to you know to summarize the contribution to knowledge then you look at the previous literature the current literature you break the literature into teams that actually govern your topic and then you are trying to know what is the current cutting edge cutting edge what is the current state of knowledge in this area that i want to do my work if i know that cutting edge the next is, where are the gaps in knowledge? Because for me to theoretically expand the frontiers of a field, I should be at, at least be closing some kind of gaps in knowledge, some, something like that. That is the academic side of the research that we want to do, maybe for masters, for PhDs or whatever. But I'm also looking at this model as something that can also be using problem solving in industry on other parts of society. So the next thing is now, what needs to happen more? So the question is, what has happened so far up to the cutting edge that has not happened so that I can now make it happen, something like that. In all this, you see me dropping into my research voice. You must make sure that you are arguing those ideas back to how you want to use them. You are not just copying it and saying, uh, okay, okay, 2003 said so, and then, you know, uh, Adego care, 2012 said so. You are just a secretary pulling together people's ideas, what are you doing with it? You have to critically think through, why am I using this idea? Can I improve upon it? All those debates and thinking are very important. And that is what is called my voice in the research process. However, you should do this so well at this, this is called the first loop, that you have a commanding knowledge of the historical development of the entire domain knowledge. Very important, so that you're not you're not leaving a lot of gaps for you to be attacked, maybe by a standard examiner who say, oh, you think you've done all this, what of this important thing? No, I'm not saying you must cover everything 110%, no. You must do so much work that even anybody examining it, oh, this guy has done a lot of work, really trying to help him to make it better, something. Of course, you then get your degree without any question. That's what I'm talking about. Then, of course, when you've done all this, you may see that, because of the new insight you got from that level of deep literature, you may need to revise that your starting point, revise your objectives, revise your questions, re, uh, you know, and that is called the backward loop. Let me shift this around you can, so that we can see the entire diagram, okay? So there is a backward loop that goes back, sorry, uh, this one, see the backward loop now. So that is why, so by going back from the new insights I got from deep literature, I'm going to revise my books and make them able to add value, actionable, easy to research, at least clear cut, and then I can go into every other thing. Let me leave the other sites I know is conventional. All of us know that. Let me go to the difference that this template makes. If you look at number one, two, three here, number one, two, three in that ladder of contribution is what we do today. So for a paper to be published in a good journal, number one should be there, the theoretical contribution, 
the links with the uh, uh, conceptual framework and the links to practice. You can see the, the, this one has to happen, the theory, the research and practice. What I'm saying is that the, the practice is not happening well enough. To enable it to happen, we need to expand this criteria of excellence up to seven. So you need to talk about model building beyond the theory, those frameworks I talked about, getting, creating them, creating enterprises or uh, what we call business plans for how the results can give us something more after the degree is awarded. That is the number four, model building beyond theory. Then you ask yourself, can I really bring up new things enough in the work to make it prescient? That is something that changes the field. It doesn't have to majority of the time. Very good works don't necessarily have to change the field, but they have to add so much deep value that, you know, one knows that, okay, this work has extended the boundaries of knowledge. Then the other thing is methodological innovation. Have I improved on the method? And for what reason? And then mark number seven, pedagogical merits. How can I teach back these new ideas in the classroom or in courses, in short courses, in workshops, to share it widely with the world. Because the reason for this is majority of the top level publications are in journals that just the same academics you read. They just talk to themselves. They're not coming out to use those papers to solve much problems. That's why I talked about translational research, trans translating the entire resource in the publication to value in the street across the political helix. Every other thing there, every other thing there is just convention. So I'll, I'll leave it for now. I'm going to share this with you anyway. Okay, so that these are the four forces. Any questions so far? Because this is a nice place to have a little bit of, uh, then maybe ask a little question, for instance. Let me just pose a little question. Uh, do you want two minutes rest before I pose a question? Hello? No, no. I think um, I think you can uh, carry Continue. on. Although, okay. although I have, I have um, uh, it's not necessarily a question, but a comment that That's aligns what you said so far. Okay. And one of those is uh, the issue of uh, translating your research into what you can use within the classroom, which is very interesting. Okay. In, in your earlier uh, slide, mm -hmm. I, I came across case stories and case studies. Yes. Uh, I was just because uh, I've always, uh, rightly or wrongly, encouraged academics to actually when they're doing case study based teaching to draw those cases from their own research rather rather than appropriating other people's research and presenting it to students as case studies what are your views on that that's a very interesting question what well, actually what are maybe just maybe the way we framed it uh, of course for you to translate knowledge it's suspected that you are doing it to what you know much about your own work definitely however you know also see that you might, because you are doing a lot of literature reviews, systematic reviews, sometimes meta-analysis, understanding what has gone on before, you might also be able to create new things from as long as you do not take it to be yours. If I, let's say now, Andy, that I create a little nice case study for, you know, a write-up of a case study of two pages or one page to support what I'm doing, but it comes from a publication that you did. I would tell my, at the end, I will say source. I will, I will say that this comes from social and so publication by social and so person this year. But this is how I am. Um, these are some of the ideas that this same author is saying that is helping us to understand this uh, uh, construct we are teaching. And I felt you people need to see it. And then even self, I have to also give them a full reference to that paper. That is how we make sure that our own work those other works that we feel are seminal in what we do are coming to the knowledge of students. And this is more important in Nigeria, for instance, where, as opposed to maybe UK and other places, where students are forced to go and do a lot of library work, do research on themselves. Where students are taught maybe a few years ago on handouts alone. We are graduating students on handouts. Some of them have not even seen how a journal looks until they come to find a year where they are battling to put together a project. And eventually they can't do it. They get to another university, get one project, remove the cover, and then plagiarize it completely. The busy lecturers that are also are teaching in different, but don't even realize that this is copy. And they submit those things, piss me to the lecturers as if they're writing it. Eventually they graduate 
and people's work. So what I'm saying is, when we change the culture of learning in a way that papers that are published are used to create something else, to create case studies, scenarios, or support the one we are creating, very important. There's no knowledge that does not stand on something else, but you need to always say your source. That's what I mean. In my own work, I normally translate my own because I, I write regularly. But I also don't want to have tunnel vision to think that all the things I write are the best and the best. No, that's why I talked about best practices at the beginning in the steeples of excellence. I must go and start literature to say, oh, what are people doing that are so in? Can I get new perspectives, for instance? Okay, for instance, just a, a little bit of work I'm now doing on uh, digital marketing just to to, to to support the marketing of uh, the things we are doing on the, on the platforms that we build. The, the major book I'm using there is here, you know, Chadwick, you know. Uh, but I'm using the book, but I'm creating from the book applications of the ideas to, you know, Ocelot systems, to, to different platforms that I built. So, of course, I have to say that, oh, these important ideas are coming from this book, but I'm using them in this way to be able to market more successfully the ideas that we are developing. So that's exactly what I mean in that sense. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for highlighting that point. I was just uh, being mindful of the time. Uh, so I'll let you carry on. Uh, I intend that uh, we will be wrapping up around about half five. Uh, okay so that we can have time to uh, ha uh open up the discussion uh, to the uh to the participants based on the information i put on the charts prior to the beginning of this um session Good. uh so that we can begin to see how it applies to our own day-to-day -day lives and uh what we can throw back as we co-create um, that knowledge going forward Thank you. So on, on, on that note, I'll let you uh, roll on. Uh, please bear, bear in mind that we're looking at about another 20 minutes to, okay. to wrap awesome. up. Okay, so what we're doing now is kick, trying to unpack some of the questions we asked before. What does the Kodupu Helix actually stand for? I've already explained it stands for you know academia, industry, government, and wider society. You can always think about examples. What I tend to do every time is when I finish a piece of work, I say to myself, how can I move this work or ideas in this work into this into the helix, the cure helix. I know I call it cure helix. Okay. Now, and once I think it, honestly, you'll be surprised the amount of ideas that will be, you know, coming to me. Okay. And most of the time there is that eureka feeling that, oh, that the fact that I can take these ideas away from academia itself to begin to apply them. In these other three areas, the industry, government, and what is gives it so much power, extra power, and that's what makes you more, uh, you know, impactful. When I talk about high impact, that's what I mean by impact. You know, um, we need to continually nurture the excellence, the riot excellence, because the, and this is part of why we are doing this workshop, and this is why we are making the workshop free, to be honest, especially to people coming from the partner institutions or from the SSGS Academy, which we established so that all of us can come together and talk about these things. And again, these innovations that we are bringing in based on the excellence must cut across research, teaching, learning, assessments, consulting, community services. And the question I keep asking, why is it that every department, most departments in universities don't have consultancy units? They don't have that little thing that can enable both the students and the academics and professors to come together to practice the creed of those disciplines, to apply those constructive problems so that the students are learning how it is done. So that eventually, if they're taken through four years of training, they imbibe the capacity to use their knowledge to do things. That's why they become more employable. And these are the things we're talking about. We need to develop capacities in innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Of course, I talked about that before, and a lot of good work is going on in that area or in that space. Now, the other thing I, uh, we are talking about is, how do we, you know, keep working in all the our own main field so that we still maintain our intellectual identities while we are still working across the sevenfold, sevenfold ways, the student services and all those other areas? The important thing is to make sure that we are constantly renewing our knowledge in our own field and we're asking the questions about how do we translate the knowledge somewhere. So we still maintain our identity. We don't get lost in translation. Okay. Now, in trying to bring it to a sense of close, uh, while, of course, I know that there's a lot of work to write 
a set of uh, learning pack or rather we'll call it you know a, a reflective pack based on the questions you ask and push back to us let me just emphasize there uh, here that uh, in terms of the fourth question we are dealing with today which is where i am at the moment the question is how can the priorities of academia and the professorate in nigeria african developing countries of the global south be reconsidered to enable them to become developed to enable those parts of the world to become developed so i was suggesting that we need to blend ideas i mentioned one book that looks dated but that book is extremely powerful that is why i even got the first idea of riot but they call it diet that is they use d for for research so it's discovery integration of knowledge applications and teaching the book was mentioning that that is one big missing part of even american education i was shocked when i saw it i said if this can happen if somebody is saying that american education lacks something whether nigeria whether africa where are we then we need to sit up and do something that book is fully quoted so anybody can pick it from amazon or anywhere okay now so we need to do that and that's just exactly what how to do it is what i'm i'm talking about today oh let me say humbly how i do it because how you do it may vary a little bit the important thing is that you have to do it you have to come out of that disciplinary shell where you limit yourself as a statistician as a marketer as an economics ask questions of interdisciplinarity the connections among knowledge bases how bringing knowledge together can help me to solve bigger problems in collaboration with other people from the same pure helix and that's when this circle turns full circle that's when the it becomes a virtuous cycle of collaboration that produces a lot of things at the end of the day okay the next thing is the insight from the four forces will help us to do that and you notice that from now i'll be releasing a lot of publications that develop different aspects of what i'm sharing today with you and it will be again widely circulated uh, on the platforms that we use where we are going to direct you to download them uh, and things like that now let's also look at the third point there promoting new cadres of higher educational institutions that is because you know part of the problem we have in africa today you may have these wonderful ideas maybe you are just the head of the department a professor you may not do much because most of the power lies with the senior management group the vcs the dvcs and others deans so we might not be able isn't it to move let's say a big federal university in nigeria to start recalibrating how they promote people so that people must be promoted clearly on these four criteria properly demonstrated not just ticking them as boxes so if that happens i'm afraid we may have to build a new university altogether that honestly even if it's online to show what is called the alternative because when maybe 10 years after building that new university people see that that is where the ratings are happening that is when those other institutions that are a bit lethargic a bit difficult to change without saying oh if we are bleeding if we are losing a lot of students if we are not making enough impact and these young things coming up are overtaking us then we need to sit up the same way when you see a government that is so bad we create alternative government not to say not to say we are undermining the government but we create different ways of doing things so that the real thing can come out and we can compare finally finally we talk about cascading such skills globally what we call transformative globally transformative education i will summarize that quickly now it's almost like a kind of a, a mantra that a globally transformative transformative education and training in order to scale fast should have online online channels it can still be hybrid because we cannot throw away the classrooms that are still important for face to face work but the online will also be serious for any institution that wants actually to do work that is reasonable so that you know people that are not all, directly students can access a lot of what we are doing from their homes either through short courses through you know uh, coming in as uh, for their cpds you know so that the model i'm using at about now is to say the i created new courses so that i say these courses must be delivered through three channels the, the the core one will teach students in the class and the uh, digitally but short courses developed from each module that can be used across the helix and that can involve workshops short courses case studies and things like that now if we can do that 
But the problem at the moment is that we need to, first of all, look at the entire stock of academia itself, the, the lecturers themselves, who are wonderful in what they are doing so far, but there has not been any incentive for them to do far more than that. And of course, there are challenges in the countries we're talking about. For them to become corporate academics, while still becoming deeply, you know, and knowledgeable people in their fields. So they must be experts as they are now, but experts that can do things instead of talking about things. Do you want me to end it here so we have enough time for discussion and questions? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yes, um, it, it's um, it's a great place to actually end because um, I think you pulled everything together and your slide actually speaks for itself. Uh, absolutely. So yeah, this is um, where we actually um, draw the curtains for now. Um, I will invite um, anyone that has any sort of um, comments or stories to share with us to um, omit themselves and um, get on with it. Let's have a look and see. Let's have a look and see if anyone is. Um, I've got their yeah. hands up. So let me go out of that. Uh, yeah. So that. Right. You want to stop sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, well. Yeah, yeah. I if think they want to look at any slide. Yeah, I think you, you can leave it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. That's if right. they want yeah. to look at any slide, I can easily go to the slide, you know, and expand. Yeah, yeah. I've I've got um. Uh, I think I will put somebody on the spot actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, Engineer Martin. Engineer Martin, uh, I know you just joined. Uh, but kindly. In, by the way, Engineer Martin is one of my MBA students at Unisic Business School. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm giving him the opportunity to, uh, because he's a, he's a very well-established practitioner, very well positioned in the Anambra State Government Fire Service Department. Um, okay. He has a, a vast range of experience in, 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 uh, in a practitioner capacity. So okay. can I just ask Engineer Martin, um, what, what do you think? What do you think um, universities should be doing to engage with, with the real world? What are academics doing that, that uh, they're, they're not quite doing well to align with, with your, for example, your, your line of work and your, your experience in, in, on, in the front lines or on the front lines? Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, first of all, I want to... I want to appreciate the organizers of this program. Um, I'm sorry I just joined, uh, but uh, just looking at the the concluding part of it, I think is um, is something that is well uh, fashioned. Um, to the question, um, first of all, the university at the university level, uh, I think I've already had some little experience on uh, these and that, which are not really happening outside the school system, which is the practical area. Because most of the times you find out that the things that are done in the, in the inside the school there, that mostly the, the theoretical part of the whole system, whereby the practical aspect, which is going to uh, allow a student who is going outside the world there to practice, may not be able to, to get it useful to other things. Now, that is even why I decided to come back again to go into MBA, because I know being that I am at the managerial uh, uh, office or position, I find out that there are a lot, a lot of things which I've not really gotten properly. And I believe that in this one, uh, MBA uh, executive is practically different from ordinary MBA. Then at this point, the practical aspect of the whole thing and that is the area of participation and what is going to uh, help students to achieve more. Thank you, Martin. Sorry for putting you on the spot, but your your your, your voice is well noted. Thank Patrick, you very much uh, for that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Patrick, and do you have any comments on that uh, uh, yes. voice, that student voice? Yes, I have a comment. I, I I want to thank Martin first. That's the kind of thing. That's, those are the challenges that I noticed, you know, much earlier, and we are trying to fix. Uh, Martin, it, it's interesting to let you know that we've been trying to fix this problem since 2005 when we established the African Higher Education and Research Observatory. And the main focus, I'm going to give you a URL for that, and you find out that when you read the, when you read the goals of that uh, organization, 
is about doing all these things. You know, they are quite, uh, you know, because you know what? If we are able to apply the learning we got right from BSc in a more practical way, why still being theoretically, you know, because the theory is already what you learned anyway, but being able to apply that theory in a nice way is very important. And that's why I decided again to think about how do we enable, you know, graduates to be able to do it. And all of us, I created the seven E's because these seven E's appears to bring everything about practice together, your expertise, your experience, entrepreneurial skills, employability, all those things. Uh, a range of soft skills that can enable you to have more impact, work better with people, be a team player, communicate better, and things like that. And more importantly, execution, doing. If you don't do stuff enough, you're not going to have enough wealth created. The graduate unemployment will continue to blossom, or blossom in quotes, because that's not, blossom is supposed to be have a positive connotation, but I mean, uh, for yeah, unemployment to blossom, I mean, become yeah. more more problematic. That's what I mean. So, Patrick, so you, Patrick, you, you, sorry. you can see that that's what we're trying to do. Yes. Mm. Please uh, uh, go back to that slide. You remember, I talked about three key phrases from the beginning. Uh, the four forces. You, which, I, which, I, I love those the four, four forces. forces. I need. Okay. I think we need to emphasize those four forces. The four Fs. Okay, let me come to them. Yeah. The four Fs are important. You, you know. We as marketers always talk about the four P's with all these extensions. <laughs> okay. Let's zero in on these four F's. Yeah, I'll get them. I'll get them. The four first. Uh, yes. After the seven ways, I think it's slide probably seven, seven or eight. Seven, yeah. yeah. So these are the four forces. Yes. That's the, yes. That's the four forces. Yes. This is very important, especially the second bullet point and his sub and, and his baby points underneath it. Yeah. Talking okay. about you want me to research, talk about them. Yes, please. Uh, you know, and I want us to have a conversation. It's not just you, because you've already talked about this. I just, I'm just drawing you back for the benefit of okay. those that might have missed the point here, uh, okay. because those sub bullet points talking about types of research, basic, applied, translational, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and of course the the five teaching formats. You see those sub bullet yes. points. I want them unpacked. That's okay. that's why I've drawn drawn our attention to this particular slide. And okay. let's start with you and, and just tell us what you had in mind when you put this slide together. Okay, let me quickly say again, of course, what I want us to do is to each of us ask ourselves honest questions. What do we understand by excellence in research within our own things? I know so that in statistics, I'll ask myself that thing. Of course, statistics are not the things I do. You in your own field, computing, history, sociology, philosophy, physics, microbiology. What do you understand to be excellence in research? What I want to think here, okay, is that if the understanding of excellence is in research is more about just publishing papers in the field, you are not in this game we're talking about. It is that and you must move those ideas from the journal papers or the books you write on them to doing them to practicing them that's what's important you may not do it alone you can do it with others that's why every department must have either a lab a consultancy unit if it's not an elaborative based course a consultancy unit I, as a matter of fact one of the experiments i'm doing today is to establish a lab for history if there is anything that can because that's so easy to do but i i wonder why historians don't have a lab so let me not go there, but just to show you what I mean. Now, another thing is this, integration of knowledge. If we're not bringing knowledge bases together, how are we going to solve a big problem? An elephant has too many parts. You cannot just see it completely. So you need other, elective, other things around it. One other thing I need to say, why is it that we have electives in universities? When I studied statistics at the UNN, I did electives in physics first year, then economics and mathematics until I graduated in statistics. What are those electives doing if I don't use them to expand my capacity to apply statistics? And that is why I eventually did. I did far more electives in economics and ended up going to business school to study more about business and then ending up working now across statistics, mathematics, finance, and economics. So I'm talking about a situation where we actively try to develop cognitive knowledge, to link knowledge bases, to be a bit interdisciplinary, even if it's just two disciplines that are close enough, we, we mix them up very well, stay it up, 
something better comes out. Now let's Patrick, talk about applications. Pa okay. Patrick, sorry, that's an interesting point you just raised, talking about okay. that element of interdisciplinarity. It's I, just before you you talked about inter interdisciplinarity, I I was going to take you up on why do we have electives? It's why interesting. Because when I was doing my undergraduates, um, I, I started off my 100 levels uh, on the BA geography, and I graduated with a BSc economics. How did I manage to do that? Starting, starting off with geography, how did I end up with a, with a degree in economics and, and, and the BSc and not a BA? I'm not going to go into the debate about the difference between BA and BSc. Uh, it's because of the power of electives. Because when I was a, a, a geography student, I took all possible electives in economics. Yes. And I honed in my skills and developed and grew it to end up as an economics graduate. Now, that's something that's quite interesting. On the subject of interdisciplinarity, most journals, most academic journals now, the so-called top tier journals, are encouraging a movement towards that direction. In order to break away from that siloed approach that we've, we, we've, we are kicking against, because that's what, what it is. The world has moved on. You, you can begin to appreciate, let's just take about an example of, of the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. We, we've been dealt a hard blow in the last two years, so to speak. Yes. It has been interdisciplinary. It's been all hands on deck, which aligns, which aligns with that quadruple helix that we're talking about. Exactly. So it's exactly. all about all hands on deck from different perspectives, solving the same challenge that confronts everyone, irrespective of your discipline. So that's one very interesting conversation to to uh, take forward. Uh, what was the second part you were going to talk about? I'll just let you carry on with that. Then I'll come. Yeah. Back. Yes. Uh, very interestingly, um, and uh, one of the questions I asked before is why is it that an entire African continent could not even produce one single COVID vaccine? You know that question has always bothered me. Why is it that this continent, so well endowed with human and other resources, we continue to be a laggard in the Committee of Nations. Why are we doing this to ourselves? Why are we even building universities? When people who dropped out of universities, like people like Bill Gates, are moving the world today, do we really need university education? That's if in the current state it is, we don't. But if it's if it is in the way I'm looking at it, we 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 need honestly. The only thing I can say sympathetically, okay, let them be there because people have jobs. People are being paid something at least. But let me go, go to applications. Again, that links to integration of knowledge. Let me not do it too much. Teaching. Let me go to those idea of teaching formats. I'll give you a simple example. Now, you see the teaching formats. All of us do this at least somehow. But let me add some of them up because I say there are a lot more. But let me say one of them. Deliberate, deliberate practice. DP. Deliberate practice is the pedagogical structures that are used to train elite sportsmen elite sportsmen, the messages of the world, Ronaldo's, J.J. Kochas, any, all these top achievers, the pedagogical system on which they are reared or trained is called deliberate practice. Do you know the amount of power you bring into the university, a university when you begin to coach academics in that university on deliberate practice, which they can join to these five formats, the university will simply become innovative. I'm just telling you. I have not even mentioned that. The other one is CD, Creative Dialogue. Creative Dialogue was propounded by theoretical physicists. I decided to master Creative Dialogue. It's such a, 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 a very powerful system. How many, how many academics talk about that in their classes today? Everybody's feeding on these five formats because that is what we have been doing all along. When do we ask questions about what more can we do to get Africa out of the road that we are in today? I don't want to even mention, the other one is accelerated learning for the 21st century, where you are trying to teach and learn in a way that all the key intelligences, the nine of them are active. Okay? The verbal, the mathematical, the kinesthetic, that is the physical, okay? And all the other ones are active. And then the ninth one, the spiritual, which comes back to emotional intelligence. Do you see how powerful a learner or a graduate would be if that graduate on top of these five formats is coached on these three additional systems? Do you see what I mean? The other one is, of course, uh, Michael is here. 
I think he was here before, my head of the department at CCU, who was a soldier. The system that is used to teach soldiers, which is the system that produces them to be so, so able to meet objectives, achieve what they want in the battlefield, should still be the system we should be adapting to training our graduates so that they are almost like soldiers whenever they want to achieve something. That is how to move the country forward. That is one of the other systems that we're not even doing in the class. Why is it that it has to only be done by the SAS people, special uh, services, the, uh, the, 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 the green bonnets or whatever? You know, why must it be for just the, the, the Air Force people, the soldiers? And why can't we adapt it and bring it to the classroom? And there are a lot more. I only mentioned these ones. There are a lot more. So 20 pedagogical structures, and we're only doing five. Only doing five. And then we marvel, oh, hi, how I wish I'm Ronaldo. How I wish I am, I am you know, uh, Messi. Look at the amount of money that command them. When, if we can show you, if we can train you as, an, uh, as a corporate academic, the way that train that sports people, you will excel as well. You will still, not, not just about the money, you'll be extremely comfortable financially, to be honest. Why you are top of the game, in, even in your own field. I'll give you a simple example. It took me a week in joining CCU to get them a grant of 15,000 US dollars. I didn't even know I wrote that proposal. So easy. Because I have systems for doing those things. The reason I have those things is because I expanded my repertoire away from the five teaching cases and added the other 15. So I can easily manipulate things and get something new out of it. And therefore, that becomes so interesting to funders, they give me money. <laughs> so easy. But I am saying that it took me almost 15 years to learn it, to learn all the pedagogical structures. That's why I established Afri here in 2005. But I need to share these little secrets with all of us. So what I'm saying today is we need to know that where we are is never anywhere that we can move the country forward. We are not doing anything to shift the needle in Nigeria and Africa. And I'm sorry to say that. And yet we are graduating students every year. <laughs> How many of those students are getting jobs? How many of them are able to start their own businesses? This is a woke up call to all of us. I don't, I don't know whether I'm allowed to expand more or whether somebody wants to no. ask a question. Patrick, uh, let me just stop you briefly. Um, in this, uh, I'll just, um, yes, can I hear um, somebody else um, really pose a question or make a comment? Let me, let, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Yes, I'm, just before you can do I that, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. just dropping something in the chat. Uh, so while you're asking that question, can I ask the participants to please look at my uh, most recent post? Yes, Patrick, please carry on. Okay, what I want to say, please, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Because I don't want to, this is not a workshop to play blame games now. What I'm sharing with us today is a reflection on the problems and challenges I thought about. So there was a time in my life when I was also a nobody in the kind of things I'm talking about. But what I'm saying is that it takes a lot of personal hard work. You have to keep training yourself. Let me even give you a simple example today. About four weeks ago, I had to pay a thousand five hundred pounds to go into a very serious amount of training in what is called user research. Can you imagine somebody in the current situation paying a thousand five hundred pounds for a four week training that is intensive? It's because I actively develop myself. I can spend any amount of money to develop myself. Some of the things I've been pushing out or we have been pushing out under the SSGS Academy or I have been pushing out even to the platforms at the CCU. Majority of the lecturers don't even look at them. While myself, who is pushing it out, is paying so much money to continue training myself. I want us to wake up. If you are not anywhere well as an academic, can't you think of other skills that can help you to even earn well? Who tells you that you can? You must rely on your salary in a month? How much is that salary after all? Learn other skills. In as much as you're working for your university, do they also own your, your evenings? Do they own your weekends? It is those times that you are trying to resolve. You can also do it as part of the university. When the money comes in, they give you something. They take some. But 
To say that all I'm doing is because I'm a lecturer in microbiology, lecturer in physics, that's the only thing I can do in my life. It's a colossal waste of capacity. If you know how powerful you can be by the way you are created, you are using less than one thousandth of your capacity to do one single course. And maybe you're even teaching just second years and first years in a new university or whatever. Even if you are supervising masters, it's just physics, physics. You're not adding any value. What have you built from the physics for all these years? That's what I'm saying. You must go beyond this traditional thing that is killing us the way it has always been done to expand the horizon of your capacities in order to do stuff. Very important. Just yet, just, just about four days ago, you net gave me an appointment. The person that even told me about it is my HOD, Michael. Said, oh, the central bank wrote to say that I've been appointed to help to teach one course or the other in UNEC, in this, because Central Bank Center for Finance and Economics. Am I not a statistician? You see me being given an appointment by the Central Bank to teach something on finance and economics. Maybe a, a little bit of statistics. But I'm saying, if I did not develop myself to the level I can, I can coax disciplines, why should Central Bank spend that kind of money on me? These are the questions I'm trying to ask. Of all of us. Please, can we put a lot more effort into developing ourselves, especially the interdisciplinary skills we need to play this game? Let me talk about professionals. If you are a professional today, let's say KPMG, let's say UKD, FID, Department for International, you will notice that the skills that you'll be using are not from one discipline. You might be doing project management, but you study the, you know, uh, management. You might be doing, um, performance management, but studying mathematics. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. We must not define ourselves by what we studied. We must de define ourselves by what we can do with what we studied. Otherwise, we keep marveling at the Elon Musk of this world, the biggest of this world, the owners of Google, Jeff Bezos of Amazon. These are simple human beings that did the right thing for themselves, which we fail to do for ourselves. And we become almost enslaving ourselves to a particular organization waiting for this traditional salary at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Patrick. That's a very um, interesting point you just made. I think uh, some of the key takeaways, because that's what we're moving towards now, I'm hoping that we'll wrap, wrap up this by six, which is the next um, uh, 20 minutes max. Um, I think we need to start working towards the key takeaways from this event today. Uh, I will just highlight two, uh, based on what you've just said now, uh, which is about personal development. You mentioned about coughing up 1,500 pounds. I wouldn't do that anyways. Uh, for, pers for personal development, I haven't got it, seriously. Now, you see, for personal development, that's something that's quite interesting. It's all about that personal sacrifice, knowing what you want, and, and, and um, uh, well, to a certain extent, you might want to call it delayed gratification. I can see uh, somebody's hand up. Let me have a quick look. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Engineer Martin, I'll, I'll call you up next. Uh, hopefully, I will, I will get some more hands before we wrap up. So, Engineer Martin, I'll call you up next. Let me just land. Um, uh, so, that personal development element is quite important. Uh, the second the second element um, has to do with uh, the scenarios in terms of actually, uh, I think there's somewhere in your presentation, you talked about the curriculum, innovative yeah. curriculum. Yeah. So what makes a curriculum innovative? I've been, I have, I have nearly two decades of curriculum development. What makes it uh, innovative is the fact that you're actually checking the alignments between what happens within the four walls of, of a classroom uh, and what's, what's actually happening outside. So exactly. you're not just training, you're not, it's not everybody that graduates that what, wants to work for KPMG. People want to improve on their export business. They want to they want to import Guinness from Nigeria to, to, to UK. What's happening to small businesses that are importing like uh, Af uh, African foodstuffs uh, and, and stuff like that? So that's something that I've been talking in terms of because there are different categories of employment. Students have different motivations. The demographics of the student body is changing. Do universities actually understand this? Now that's a very important point to think in terms of. And uh, finally, in terms of uh, uh, the slide on the screen. Okay. Talking about types of teaching and teaching formats, talking yes. about small groups and pair discussions, practice focus, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I remember my early days, 100 level, 200 level at the Amadou Bello University. We, we were taking notes from the road. 
we could not even fit into the lecture theater that was jam packed. You're talking about one lecture going on, 500 students spilling all over. It's just like, um, it, honestly, when you come there, you think it's a petrol station where there's fuel scarcity and the queues. We are taking notes from the road, sitting on the floor. But that's the level of dedication. Why bother? Why bother? By some, by some, by some stroke of luck, there was no megaphone or whatever the case is. We could. There was these Chinese whispers. Oh, the lecturer said, and they keep passing on that message until it gets to the to the end of the queue. Now that's something that is interesting. I hope it has changed. Large class sizes. Come think of it. Now, Nigeria is not alone in terms of large uh, class sizes. But the bottom line is, I had that opportunity within the same university in my four hundred level. I had the opportunity to actually do a team group presentation, which is shocking. God bless him. One of my professors, um, I can't remember, Professor Eshet, uh, Department of Economics in Amadi Bello University, challenged us into groups. That was the first time in my whole stay at that university. We had a group presentation and we had to type our reports. You have to go and dictate that report to IBM because uh, forget it, there was no mobile phones, no no, no computers at the time. Yes. But that was an eye opener, which gave me a soft landing. So I've got two hands up. I will okay. start with Engineer Martin, and after that, uh, Mike, uh, Doctor Michael uh, Ede will come up. Thank you, Engineer Martin, please. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, just a little contribution. Um, uh, talking about skills, in fact, that is the basis of the whole thing now, especially uh, in the country where we find ourselves, uh, uh, Nigeria, so to say. Um, every year, uh, a lot of people graduate, uh, students come out, become graduates, and there's no work. Thousands of them are outside there, and the thousands are still graduating. Now, the, I always tell people, the, the basis of the whole thing now is one to learn at least one skill to aid the person. And that is the essence of uh, bringing back the issue of practical in the, in, the, in the university system, whereby the theory will be there and the practical, in case if one comes out, then you can be able to lay your hands on one thing and start doing it. Because the white collar job is not there for, any, for everybody. Now, Another issue is we enjoy our, uh, what do you call it, um, our, our the, whatever we find ourselves, we enjoy it so much. The comfort zone. We enjoy our comfort zone. People should start learning on how to leave their comfort zone. Go extra mile, extend their tentacles to other things, apart from what that which they learned in school. <clears throat> if not, a lot of problems because no work, no job for them and they cannot live without those things. So uh, I remember then uh, in the university, uh, what I was doing, I, I remember the, uh, in the UNICEF, uh, Namja Siku University there, I remember somebody introducing to me on how to sell uh, uh, honey. In fact, I became the first person that was bringing that honey inside the school, and I go to hostels to sell it then. In as much as uh, is, is a problem to me because uh, uh, it was affecting my academics and what i am doing then but because there was no money from the onset i needed to do those things now to survive when i go outside and i'm prostate i'll go and get honey and do what and sell it to students and make little money for my living within the school system which is not the best but outside the school people should also learn on how to do all these things apart from selling one can learn skills which can help him or her to grow if not the government is not always there and you need to survive and we have to grow our families and beyond our our immediate families so i want to tell people we must leave that comfort zone our comfort zone is never comfort for us because when we see it we believe that we've arrived we've not arrived you must leave that comfort zone to make sure that you go extra mile to achieve that success which you are looking at that is my contribution thank you um, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, can we go to Dr. Uh, Ede, please? Okay. Dr. Michael Ede, please introduce yourself and um, we yeah. need to know what your uh, position is as well and your affiliation. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Um, good evening from here. Can you yeah. hear me, sir? Yes. Good yes, we can hear you. All yes. right. 
Uh, my name is Michael Onyema Ede, um, and I'm from Co City University here in Enugu, and um, precisely Department of Mathematics and Computer Science. I'm the head of the department. Um, so I want to. Mine is more of gratitude. I want to appreciate um, Professor Patrick, who is also a professor, a full professor in my department, um, for organizing this event, and also. Uh, Prof, you too. Um, at least we have been interacting on LinkedIn and all of that. Thank you also for this kind of program because it's really expository, um, very interesting and educating and empowering as well. Um, I can only say that um, some, of, um, some of the challenges that um, educators in Nigeria are facing in implementing some of these innovative, uh, excellent teaching and learning processes are much. For instance, we have seen in, in Nigeria here where my students in the Department of Computer Science, they're not necessarily close to university, but some other places as well, uh, when they are coming to school with their laptops, they are stopped on the road by policemen and harassed yeah. for, uh, for, uh, you know, and they are being labeled the uh, Yahoo boys of, uh, or fraud stars just because they are seen with laptop. So it becomes very difficult. So you see a lot of young people particularly in public institutions, being scared of carrying their laptops around. So how can they be able to implement some of this? It becomes more difficult. And because some of the public schools lack the infrastructures or the supportive um, facilities that will help educators to implement some of these things, it becomes more difficult to implement. And then we have systemic problem. Talking about the education sector, you have the, uh, uh, the education policy, you have the NUC factor there that limits many education, uh, many educational institutions from adopting some of the uh, innovations that need to be adopted. Even though um, um, there are um, rooms for schools to inculcate some of the some innovative courses in their curriculum, but they are limited. They are constrained by NUC and some other regulatory bodies. You know, and this is also a factor on its own. Then we talk about um, other challenges like lack of supportive infrastructure as well, like we do talk about. I have noticed that um, it's much easier to implement some of these recommendations in advanced countries because they are already the enabling environment. The supportive infrastructure, talking about the internet, for instance, sometimes you, you see that educational institutions like Coast City University, for instance, we will try to provide the internet, but the inter internet service providers, for instance, they are not reliable. Sometimes you, you discover that it's very difficult to get um, high speed internet assets. And it's not the fault of the school. It has to do with the providers, the vendors. So when you have a um, systemic problem like we have in Nigeria, you discover that it's more difficult for educators, for students to implement some of these recommendations, which are very beautiful. So the question now is, how can the government and other stakeholders in the education sector come in to be able to assist both the public institutions and private institutions to implement some of these new ad ideas that will help to, you know, to change or transform our education system or that will help to improve the employability skill of our graduates? And that, that will also assist educators them, uh, themselves to be able to improve on their professional development. So it takes a lot of sacrifices for uh, from people like Prof to organize this on their own, and uh, also for some of the participants to also do uh, participate in programs like that because there are no measures in place either by government and all of that to encourage, no incentive to encourage some of these things. You know, the question is, in many uh, educational institutions in Nigeria generally now, how many of them are encouraging staff or sponsoring professional development programs? Because they are limited or concerned by lack of resources and all of that. So what I'm saying is that these ideas are good, but Africa as a whole or Nigeria, to be precise, we are still lagging. We are still lagging behind, seriously in terms of implementation, because of some of these uh, factors I've mentioned and a whole lot of them, there you have strikes, for instance, because we're not just talking about private institutions, now we're also talking about public schools. You have also strike here and there, unrest, 
Now we are having sit at home every Monday in the Southeast Nigeria. So you see a lot of disruptions within the education um, uh, system here. And that is well, not what, helping. Well, what, what I need to say, what I need to say there is this, uh, Michael, that's quite a good uh, summary overview of what the problems are. My attitude has al always been in life. Despite those problems. That's what I normally tell myself. Despite those problems. Immediately I finished PhD at the University of Sheffield. I drafted myself into a training program, a, 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 you know, um, business education at Manchester. My wife was saying, what, how crazy can you be? We are even struggling financially. I said, forget about it. What I'm saying is, personal sacrifice, hard work. Because if we start doing those things that can impact the skills of our students, you will see those people you think may not want to sponsor you come out to sponsor you. The problem is that we are not even doing enough and we are always able to mention these same excuses. I understand completely. I was in Nigeria. I'm not saying that it's not challenging. I was the ASU chairman in UNICEF at le as lecturer too, and I knew the problems and challenges we, were, we went through with the late Professor Wanko, who was the DV, uh, vice chancellor, to solve Hello, most Patrick. of the Hello, Patrick. Sorry. So sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. I'll let you carry on, uh, but let's just give one person because we've been begging these people to come out. Henrietta, okay. I've seen the hand up. Okay, Henrietta, let, let yeah, us, that's fine. Let us hear one last question, then you carry on, please. No problem. Henrietta, no, no, also, told your, your hand is up. Is that by accident? No, no, it's all right, but she needs to unmute, I think. She needs to unmute herself. Right. Uh, Henrietta, also, I told. Can you wait? Good evening, now. Good evening. Okay, good evening. Yeah. Good evening. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof, um, for this incisive um, discussion. Um, I would beg to agree with what Prof said. His last comments, because I was just coming from a meeting from Abuja this evening, and uh, there are so many innovations because we went for research and the development uh, directors for research and development. So many people have gone out of their way. There is a student that did um, anti city and uh, in combination, in collaboration with one agency that are in charge of um, all this I ICT. You see, in the southeast, in fact, I worked at Abuja because it was a one-week meeting with the Honorable Minister. Our people are mediocre, including myself. We don't go out of our way. We don't stretch our limits to do something. Because that um, particular student um, told everybody his experience. Nobody recognized him, but when he reached a height, The Honorable Minister, now an ICT agency. And I found that apart from UNISIC and the Federal Dental um, um, College, where I am, where I'm the director for research, and all in one other university in Southeast, only the North and the Southerners are there. And I keep asking myself, what are people? Do we keep complaining? And the people keep saying, Ebos are traders and all these things. We are, we are going nowhere. And the minister said it emphatically. They are going to support research that will be commercialized and will give services and products. And I beg when we are teaching students to keep hammering on all these things. There are opportunities in Nigeria, even though things are bad. But when somebody gets to a high, definitely by God's grace, people will come in and help the person. Give your research a product and a commercialization and services for the nation and the People will come in to support. That is my stake on all these things. Thank you so much for everything. That's a good uh, comment. Thank, thank you very much, Areta. I'm, I'm very glad I gave you that opportunity because um, um, participants will not have an opportunity to say anything <laughs> in addition to this. I'll just um, go back to Patrick uh, to, to put across or rather uh, conclude uh, what this session is and what the key takeaways are and possibly highlight what the next steps will be because we tend to do this thing. We, we actually sacrifice. We're not, we're not getting paid to do this, you know. Uh, we're actually sacrificing our own time 
to ensure that we try to capacitate anybody that wants to buy into the, the entire narrative of personal development and make that change. So we tend to do these things on a, on, on a monthly um, sort of basis. So based on that, um, I'll just uh, give, yield the floor to Patrick to give some sort of um, closing comments. And if he wants to respond to the points that Hereta so much hammered on uh, um, a few minutes ago, that would be great as well. Over to you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you so much. And let me also thank everybody that has come to this uh, workshop. Um, I know how difficult it is in these times for people to bring out time for a two hour session of, of exchange of ideas of this nature. Um, and I appreciate that. So what I'm trying to summarize now is just to look at these four forces. Even if the, the major thing you need to take away from here is just this page and the um, seven fold ways. Because in those four, in those, in that wheel of the corporate academy, you will see 33 distinctively innovative activities you can be engaging in that are not really affected by some of these challenges we talked about. There are things that come from within you, things that are in your own control, and they enable you to become visible in the way you create artifacts, the way you create knowledge that other people can pick up and say, oh, something good is happening here. People are getting value. People are getting more skill. Therefore, this is the kind of thing we can put a little support for. And the money will come. The money always comes. I'll tell you the truth. When the quality is there. So I am just summarizing by saying, please, if your philosophy had always been things like maximize my publications to become a professor, maintain it, but reinforce it to this first bullet point, the corporate academic philosophy and enterprise, develop things from your knowledge. Write those papers, translate them to other things, okay? Services, models, frameworks, or present those papers in workshops that can teach professionals new skills or can enhance the way things are done in any part of the quadruple helix, that is academia itself, industry, government, and wider society. Make sure that you are not over-specializing in, in that your particular field. If you get a PhD already in a field, you're already special. Be careful not to over-specialize because that's the problem we may have. You get into the tiniest area of a field and it becomes difficult to practice it because you're only playing with constructs that are very tiny. They don't move anything. Make sure that as long as you are keeping yourself up to date in your field, you are moving away to apply knowledge, to integrate knowledge, to teach new things that you discover back to the ones that are learning. And that makes sure that even when you write, you write your papers, all the seven points possible, as many of them as possible, contribution to are coming in the paper. As a matter of fact, because I don't want to leave it to the legacy journals, I decided to float a complete publishing firm, which is almost finished. And those are the criteria. And that is the publishing firm I would like to put a lot more of my own publications, of course, reviewed by others, and maybe yours. The idea is for you to see the difference between a paper written to those protocols and the one we're writing now. And I'm going to release the entire writing framework for everybody to use. Now, Make sure that you understand other skill sets that are not really technical, where areas you studied. Focus on the seven E's of education, for instance. Make sure at least four of those E's are playing for you. Make sure you keep continually developing yourself, for instance. And this is very important. And then make sure that you are using some powerful frameworks to create things. One of the ones I easily use is the the one I created from PhD research for developing digital firms. That's why it was it's easy for me to structure those firms and float them. We have eight of them now in the internet, for instance. And there are different levels of development. One of them is almost, you know, a, a big global institute for doing almost anything in research and learning. Almost, almost a, a, a big university in a sense. But the important thing is that I'm doing it because I know that I don't want to wait for colleagues who are not incentivized in traditional universities to do those things. They may not be incentivized to do those things. So I don't want to leave it to them because I'm thinking about the future of Africa. And then there is, uh, I want to also say, I will release the research methods canvas. 
we can mentor people. I don't take money to mentor. I'm mentoring about 15 people now. I know that Andy is also mentoring some. Okay. Some of them I bring into my UK business. The, some of them are crunching data with me now. I transfer their own payments. I don't need to be saying this because that's my passion. I brought them in so that they can learn more. One of them was saying to me, oh, so he does not know that statistics can be used this way. I said, that's because I have expanded my scope. So I can get those projects in and they're well paid. So what I'm saying is, can we all please do just that little we can do and, and, do, and, and show that you can do something in the mathematics and computing department and in the faculty at CCU and in my center in Ibaro, I will try to do a lot more to modernize the curricula, to bring in income through these new ideas, to connect government so that more money can come in. Very important. But let's continue to work as if there is no tomorrow. Let's get something going so that all these years of years of budget not getting employed going back to live with their parents for other years, not getting married when they should because there's no money to do that. A lot of things are happening. And that's why the country is boiling because people have not been developed. No opportunities. It has to happen in from higher educational institutions, the way we coach people and give them skills. This is where I want to say that I don't need to do more of that because all these slides are coming to you with additional notes. Please read those notes. I've sent not less than 12 powerful documents to the platforms in DUI and CCU. I am not sure the uptake of those documents. I need to know whether people are actually reading them. One of them was actually a framework for publishing based on the research methods canvas, a full paper on it. It's on that platform. 